Yes. Hi, hi, people. I'm uh, Frank Martin from Scranton, Pennsylvania, a diehard Mickey Mantle fan. And uh, th through uh, Mr. Fogel, I'm able to do this thing with some help from my friends. I hope it goes well. Hello, Frank Martin. Yes, Johnny. Tell me one question here, buddy. Answer for me. Is it possible that you became a Mano fan? You have to tell us why you were so dedicated to the McMahon. Well, it goes back to my younger days. Uh, I never knew my uh, father. You know the story. They separated when I was about two years old. And uh, I was teased a lot in high school. You know, kids can be cruel, not having a father or everything. And at the time, Mano was right coming into his prime, triple crown year of 56. He was really on top of the world. He was like, you know, incredible. And I kind of, I guess, gravitated towards him because he, he, he really helped fill my hours, my life, gave me a lot of thrills, and my mother. And I just became a real fan probably in 56 when he won the Triple Crown. He was really it back then. Everybody wanted, wanted to be Mickey Mantle. And uh, that's how it started, 56. I was seven years old. And then I kept following him every year, all the great years, all the injuries. You know, I just lived it and uh, had a chance to meet him many times. Were you always a Mickey fan, Frank? Well, because of Mickey, I was. So prior to 56, did you follow me? Yeah, I did. I was following him in 54, 55. Okay. But until he won the Triple Crown, I really didn't, uh, I guess, I know, I, it, it, it was insane after that year. Yeah. I was reading an article a while back that in the 50s, every kid in the world wanted to be Mickey. Everybody wanted to be him or anybody else. In the world, he was just it. You know? And baseball was king then. There was no NFL, there was big. It was horse racing, boxing, and baseball. Basketball, NBA was nothing back then. And Mantle was the king of his sport. He was king. And he was on every TV show. He endorsed every product known to mankind. He just became so big, like a, like a rock star. And I just, I just started with that and watching him play. He had incredible talent, God-given skills. I know Casey Stingle said, and DiMaggio, when I saw him in his rookie year, that he was the greatest talent ever saw in a baseball uniform, bar none. Pure talent, wrapped in one body. So, so, so at that time when he came up in the early 50s, that, that was 51. a big time uh, for baseball in New York. It was. Right. Ma Mays, rookie year. Mays, Jim. Duke Snyder. Duke Snyder came up in 47. And Joe D had retired in 51, uh -huh. which Mickey played one year with him in 51 as a teammate. They played the World Series together. Willie Mays had that fly ball when he wrecked his knee because Joe D called him off late. He stepped in the rubber cover drain, blew his knee out, which kind of started everything. You're a DiMaggio fan too? You're an well, I love Joe D. Yes, I, 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 I met think you'd be a DiMaggio fan. I, oh, because he's a Yankee. I, I, uh, I met him a few times. He was always very nice to me. Yeah. Willie. Uh, uh, there's so many stories, but it started with Mickey in the mid-50s. It just started to grow. And how old were you then when you started following in 56? Well, I was seven years old when he won the Triple Crown. But I, I, in 56, I was seven. seven. But I, I, I followed me before that. But, you know, I was following Willie and Duke and everything. Right. But he just hooked me in 56. And after they won their fifth straight World Series in 53, the five in a row, which is a record, I really became, I started to notice it more. Five in a row. And then he hit the Grand Slam in the 53 World Series off of Russ Meyer on your wife's birthday, October the 4th, 53. Yeah, my wife's birthday. And I remember that as a four-year-old, watching with my uncle. I couldn't believe it. Who's that, Uncle Sam? Who's that? That's Mickey Mantle. Wow. The name. You know, the brand name of his name is Key Man. Key Man. He told me that as a kid. I never forgot it. He said, Key Man Francis. That's my real name. And I remembered that. And it just blew from there. Every year it got worse and worse. He got better and better. As one sports writer put it, it was like watching Clark Kent and Pinstripes. At his best. At his best. He was. family Yankee fans also? Pardon me? Your family Yankee fans uh, as well? Most of them are. I had a couple uh, who were Red Sox fans, I think. Like Ted Williams. I love Ted Williams. Yeah. But most of them are Yankee fans. My mother uh, used to listen to Babe Ruth on the radio, which was, you know, she, she listened to him. But once she had me, I became obsessed. And she became a bigger fan because of me. And I drove her nuts. And that's really how it started, was, was, was the Triple Crown and the back-to-back -back MVPs. It just blew from there. So you had uh, television back in the 50s to watch? Yeah, we had TV. It yeah. was a little small 17-inch, mm -hmm. black and white, no remote control, of course. It was, yeah, I saw him on the World Series, and... Uh, it was really cool for a kid. Because they weren't on every day back then. No, right? only the game of the week, Jim. So one day on Saturday. Week, right? yeah. CBS, Key, Reese, and Dizzy Dean. And then, uh, yeah, then the, the Yankees in the World Series almost every year. It was, you, it was unbelievable. I got sport. I got sport. I don't want to elaborate on one question. And how far did you push 
Mickey that it just became that you just couldn't be without him, it seemed like. Well, Everybody just, knows you as, oh, the, the big man. man. But as a child, it was just, I don't know, it just kept growing. And it's hard to explain the hold he had on this country, not just me, the youth of America. And it just, like I said, it, was, it just kept growing. And I went to games as a... I can't explain it. It was like he had a hold on a lot of people, a lot of young young kids. What was the first game he saw? On July 8, 1961, against the Red Sox, he homered off of Tracy Sallard, who gave up Maris his 61st, and he also third, stole third base. I can't believe how fast he was. Yeah. Unbelievable. I was only a kid. I wanted to jump on the screen. He went in the upper deck, 480. I remember reading the paper the next day. Off of Sallard, 480. Then he stole third base, and he could have had a sandwich for the ball. So fast. He could have had a sandwich before the ball got there. I mean, it was unbelievable. I could run. Remember like it was yesterday. World-class speed, Lisa. I mean, he had world-class speed. He could have ran in the Olympics. That's how fast he was. Who was that the, the game with you? My Uncle Rocky, my favorite uncle, lived to be 90. His son, Billy, and me. Billy was a couple years older than me, but he wasn't a big baseball fan. Okay. I'm trying to tell Billy, Billy, you're watching greatness. Mm -hmm. I know, Francis, I know. Uh, but that was my first game. Then he took me to the first Mickey Mantle day in 65. When Bobby Kennedy snubbed Joe DeMott. I mean, Joe D. snubbed Bobby Kennedy when Kennedy was introduced after Maryland died. He actually snubbed Bobby Kennedy on the baseline, turned his back to him. This is well known. Is Joe right? D. It's, it's the first Mantle day in 65. Oh, he snubbed him. Okay. Wouldn't, talk, wouldn't even look at him. He hated it. I don't want to get into that. <laughs> so then, but it's, 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 there's a million stories that are probably boring people already. And Frankie, and what happened then all of a sudden? What made you come up with autographs? You seem like you've been a little bit ahead of other people. No, I don't know about ahead, Johnny. Uh, I started collecting autographs in the, uh, I guess, the mid '60s. The first one I got was Whitey Ford, a, a, a Hall of Fame pitcher, at a Yankee game with Boston in August of '64. Me and my my buddies went with their dad, and they took me with them. And Whitey's coming in from the parking lot, and he signed my little book. I still have it. I was 15 years old. Whitey Ford, I'm going. Is Mickey here yet, Whitey? If Mickey's here, you're not going to get near him if he's here, you know. But it, that was the first autograph was Whitey Ford. And I just took off from there. Whitey, you know, this is the greatest pitcher in Yankee history at the time. Starting pitcher, anyway. At one time, Frankie, yeah. what is the most Mano autographs you had to uh, your name? Probably 230. Wow. Now it's down to about 100, 105. Yeah. I had to sell a lot of stuff. I don't want to get into That's why. That's okay. There's no problem. I had to move some stuff, but I still yeah. got approximately 100, yeah. 105. And, and then your mom became a man on lover because of you. I'm well, sure. mom met him twice at Monticello Race. Well, I don't want to get into detail. 1971. They had a Mickey Mantle night. I took her up. We met him. He signed autographs. And, and, and then she, this was, he was at J.C. Penney's in May of 73. We met him there. Signed it at the mall. May 14th. I told him, Mick, it's your seventh and a... Seven, your sixth anniversary, your 500th home run, May 14, 67. He said, yeah. I said, yeah, Mick. Six years to the day in 73 at 500. This is May 14th. Yeah. I, said, I said, yeah, Mick, May 14th. I don't think you remember the day. <laughs> you did. I did. And he kind of laughed. Yeah. Yeah. And he, it was a huge crowd. The line's out the door. It was one free autograph per person. One free. Before card shows. Way before. You didn't have to pay for it. Yeah. And it was, that was, then I met him many times, many times. I, many, I don't want to get into How many times do you think you met Mickey? Uh, two dozen. Two dozen? Wow. Car shows, banquets, golf tournaments, uh, shopping nice. malls. Of course, my biggest is my car show, Lisa. That was, I had him for two days in 1985 at the Hockey Arena in Wilkes-Barre. I saw Rama. Had him for two days. Yeah, you, he sold, uh, he sold, he signed a thousand autographs a day, sold out eight bucks an autograph, and he signed bats and jerseys. People were ringing ten bats to get signed yeah. for 80 bucks. And I sat with him for two days, got tons of pictures, I joke with him, I'm sitting with him, and I can't believe I'm sitting with him. I'm watching, I'm looking at his Hall of Fame ring, and I'm staring at it. I didn't have the nerve to ask if I could try it on. I wouldn't ask him that, but I'm looking at it. That's his Hall of Fame ring. Yeah. And we sat for two days talking, yeah. mostly me. Uh -huh. My partners had, but not, they wanted me to sit with them. So how did that, how did, that, how did you make that happen? Thanks to Tom Cattell, well you know Tommy Cattell. He was Mickey's agent. Mm -hmm. I met him at a show on Saturday night with Sandy Colfax in New York. And I had a Mantle t-shirt on. He never would have talked to me. If I had a Yankee shirt, big deal. I had a Mantle t-shirt on, not this one. And he said, hey, you like the Mick? I says, yeah. Well, I'm handling them now. You want to go to a show when I have them? So are you kidding me? Let me know, Tommy. So he said, I'm going to Dallas to see Mick for two days and spending time with him. We're playing golf. I'll call you when I get back. He took my number. He called me. He didn't know me from Adam. Tom Cattell. And he called me. He seemed to like me. I don't know why. Yeah. But he says, Frank, you your enthusiasm is off the charts. 
you know, and we got friendly. You met him. Yeah, he's a great guy. He used to handle Mick. I've, I've gone to many of Tommy's shows with Mick. He had all the greats, you name it, DiMaggio, Williams. He had Ali at a show. I met Ali at a show in 83. Uh, Mickey outdrew Ali by three. It wasn't even close. I drew him by three to one. It wasn't even close. Tommy had the best line, Jim. He said, man, I would outdraw God by 50%. But he said, don't tell God I said that. <laughs> Tommy said, he said, I'll draw anybody. They would bring sleeping bags at the hotels and sleep overnight to get tickets because he would sell out so fast. Or, advanced tickets. Yeah. And sleeping bags. I swear to God. Tommy said, Frank, it's crazy. Frank, well, yes, sir. at your other apartment, yeah. I noticed you had a big, huge case of all ball signed and stuff. Yeah. How many Hall of Famers do you have autographs? Well, not all the balls anymore. It's paper. I probably have 50 different Hall of Famers, Johnny. That's great. I don't have all those balls anymore. I moved some. But it's mostly Mickey, huh? Well, not all Mickey. I had a lot of the greats, uh, but maybe 50 total. And you know, I heard a story one time about your trip down to... Philadelphia to pick up man in a little plane. Oh, that was at my car show. I really show. think that uh, people yeah. would love to hear the story on I'm lucky I'm alive. home and who was driving and I'm who lucky. was flying the plane. I'm lucky I'm alive. Tell, tell, tell us the story on that one. Well, he was doing games for Sports Channel, Lisa. It was the weekend in Toronto, the last weekend of the season. Yankees were still in the race. They got eliminated that Saturday. And I had to go down on a private plane to pick him up. He left Toronto, landed in Philly. I went to pick him up. So the pilot's name is Bauer, like Hank Bauer. B A U E R. My name is Martin. We pick him up at the. You want to say something? We pick him up at the airport, and he's wearing a big sailor hat to get through the crowd. But one lady wrote, "Mickey Mantle over there." That's not Mickey Mantle. Yes, it is. I said, "Lady, he can't stop now. We're running late for a show. Please don't bother him. He's got to go through this airport." So I got him through, carrying in one of his bags. We 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 flew in a little two propeller plane. It was a windy day, and I'm thinking, "I'm gonna go. I'm gonna die with my hero." I'll be part of a trivia question. Who died with Mickey Mantle? Martin Bauer, Cattell, and the, I'll be trivia forever. Martin and Bauer died with Mantle. <laughs> Teammates. What did he What did he think when you said your name was Mark? Well, he and laughed. And the other guy was Bauer. It was Bauer. The, and he spelled it like B-A-U-E-R, Jim. Is there a... he, I, said, I said, I'm going to die with Mickey Mantle. If i got to go, what the hell? <laughs> but it was it was a little too... Frankie, yes, sir. Tell me something. Even though you've seen Mantle and you became so close with him and stuff, you were guys like, almost like brothers. You, you got uh, to meet his sister from what yeah, I hear. Tell well, us a story. I know he got to meet his sister. Well, that's Barbara, who since passed away. Uh, me and Tommy and Andrew, his partner, went to Oklahoma in, uh, in just for Halloween in 2008. He spent about four or five days. And Tommy already knew Barbara. He had bought stuff off her from Mickey, his high school yearbook. He got ten grand for that, I think, that Mickey signed. Uh, he said, let's go see Barbara and see Mickey's grave in Dallas. He's in a big uh, mausoleum, spark right next to Tom Landry, like very close to Tom Landry. Oh, God, I'd love to go, Tom. So we went to Dallas. We rented an SUV, went to the gravesite, saw Mickey's, you know, what his, two of his sons were buried there with him before Merlin died, his wife. Then we drove to Dell City, Oklahoma, to see Barbara. We spent a whole day with Barbara, and we, we took her to lunch. She was about 70 then. And sweet lady. And Barbara says to me, Frank, you know more about my, about, about my brother than I do. And she, Tommy says, Barbara, you have no idea who you're talking to. Maybe you don't want to know, but he's just nuts for your brother. And Barbara got a kick out of me. Nice lady. Got to my arm around her. I think Marshall has a photo that he sent. And then I met David and Danny many times, the two living sons. The grandson, Will, as a kid, signed something for me. He printed it. Uh, and Merlin I met at the Hall of Fame when he got inducted in 74. I went to that. I taped a speech on a little cassette tape recorder. I have his whole speech, 15 minutes. Casey was there a year before he died. I met Mrs. Ruth. I, I couldn't get her autograph, but I said hello to her. Her daughter just died. I was with her at 102. Wow. She just died at 102, her daughter. Stepdaughter. But uh, the Hall of Fame was great. And you, uh, did you meet Mrs. Mantle at that same time? I met Mrs. Mantle at the after the induction. She, she hung around the library area. I was able to go over, introduce as Mrs. Mantle. Uh, you, you don't know him, but I think your husband is the best I ever, Superman. She says, thank you. I was only 25 then. Thank you, young man. He says, you're very kind. A small little blonde, Merlin. And that was nice. And I met Mickey's mother, Lavelle, and the four sons were together. So I, I met everybody. Mickey already went inside. He didn't stick around a sign. It was crazy up there, but Merlin stuck around, and I got, I got her signature. I still have it in a book. I got her on a ball, whatever, and that's, that, that was a Hall of Fame in 74. 
And it, is it a true story that the son, one of the sons used to call you up? Yeah. He, he felt the same way that you knew more. Well, my Danny, father. the youngest son, Danny, had a company, and I got his number. I, I, I might have been a pain for him. But he said, you know, Frank, just, uh, I want your number. I, I want to keep in touch with you. This is Danny. He's like 60 now. He's a baby. And we used to call each other, talk for an hour, an hour the time, on the phone. About his dad, and wow, what, what day did dad do that? Are you sure? And I'm giving Danny the counts. He had 2 to 1, 3 0, 3 2 on certain home runs. I remember the counts. And he might have believed that or not. I did. And we just became friendly. We talked for about six months. Then his mother died, and I called off for my condolences, and I never heard from him again. So I don't want to bother him. I don't want to press it. Yeah. yeah. But he, Danny's the youngest. He's a, and David looks just like him. I got pictures with them both. David's a dead ringer for his dad. David told me, my people see me on the street, they said, aren't you dead? They think he's his father. Aren't you, didn't you die? No, I'm not Mickey, I'm David. Yes, he saw a picture, he sent Marshall a picture of me and yeah. uh, the boys. Frankie, they, yeah. they, when, they were trying, when they were getting rid of a lot of mantle stuff in New York City at the big auction. the restaurant? Oh, did, the family. Did, did you happen to get to that auction? Yes, I didn't go to the auction, I went to the preview. Me and a friend of mine, and the family, it was unbelievable, guys. They made over $4 million. And it wasn't everything that he had. Four million. I have the catalog to this day. Big, uh, huge catalog. Uh, unbelievable. And uh, I went to that. We took a lot of pictures. That's when I met David and Danny again. Got the picture with them. That was something to see that. It, it, my, everything that he almost he owned. Not everything, but 90% they sold. This is 2003, in December. It was four million dollars then. It might be 10 or 12 now. The way the hobby's gone nuts with his stuff. It was incredible. What year, what year is this? Yeah, December 2003, Jim, at the oh, Garden. Yeah. Tommy was there. Tommy bought 10 of his canceled checks. No, seven for like $18,000 at the time. He made me a cop. I have a copy of one. Wow. wow. That was incredible preview. Every contracts, MVPs, jewelry he got Merlin. It was just incredible. I, I thought so, I'd die with them. How would you find out about? where Mickey was going and where he was going to be. I mean, you lived in a time where, yeah. you know, that was this predates the internet and right, you know, I yeah. Scranton, PA, there's probably not a lot of no. New York news landed here. Well, how, what are I, you, how are you staying connected with Mickey's moving uh, doings? Well, that's that's because of the hobby publications. Be baseball Hobby News and Sports Collectors Digest. You get them every couple weeks. Mm -hmm. And they had show schedules. Who's appearing where? DiMaggio, anybody. Ali, Williams, Musial. That's how I found out about these. And Tommy gave me the tickets in advance. I didn't have to wait in line, me and my buddies. He knew I wanted to see these guys, not just Mickey. Yeah. I'd get them in advance before they sold out. And that's how we did it. Shows, through, through the papers, the hobby papers. And what? you were at his, his restaurant in New York as well? I, I went to the opening in February, photos on the wall there, February 14th. Okay. Uh, All right, so take us back to, the, to your first time at, the, at Mickey's restaurant. Uh, Plaques on the wall there. I was sitting right in the front row to his left. As I got the, one. This is the first. First for the press. For the press, right. Opening day. But he got me in. He uh, got us two passes. And, and that wasn't a sports writer. When is this 1980? 88, February 4th. The plaque is dated. At February 4th, 88, Jim. With Mickey wearing a suit, the purple suit. Oh, there he it's is. autograph. Number yeah, seven. I, I was in the first row. We, I was the first one to sign the guest book, they said. I mean, I'm talking a guest book. And I got in with my buddy Donnie, my show partner. This is after my show, three years. And uh, they had the case filled with the root jerseys, the mantle jerseys. I'm touching the jerseys. I'm just feeling them. I said, oh my God, I'm getting goosebumps. Mm -hmm. So they sat us in with the press. They had food for us. Really good spread. Chicken wings, shrimp, whatever. You know, drinks. And the Bob Costas walked in. Oh, I love Bob Costas. I shook his hand. Nice to meet you, Bob. How are you? You know, he, he emceed the whole thing with the questions. I was in the front row. Me and my buddy. He had the camera. I had the tape recorder. And he started taking questions. And I was able to get one in. Uh, what did you about, ask? Uh, it, it might have been about the Fisher home run in 63. They called the moonshot. Uh, Mickey said it was the hardest ball he ever hit off of Bill Fisher. He said the bat actually bent in his hands. And he wasn't a braggart. If you know the only Yankee Stadium, it was where the ball hit was 500 feet distance, 108 feet up. And it was a line drive, according to Tommy Tresh, still rising. It bounced back to the lip of the infield. That's the force. It, it, it scared the bats and the bird. That they flew out. It was a night game. Extra innings, the bats flew out and the pigeons. He woke them up. It bounced back to the Lippity field, And you're not going to believe this. He hit that facade a few times. But he said that was the granddaddy. 
A line drive now. I'm not going to fly ball. Computer estimate. And Tom Tresh swore to me, there's a cleat board in Cooperstown, 734 feet. He said that might be short. It bounced back to the infield, Jim. On a line, it, like a line drive still going up. It, was, it wasn't a fly ball, it was a line drive. 500 feet distance, 108 feet up. Still going up. And his teammates swore it was a bullet. I talked to guys that were their fans, and, and one guy said, if you blinked, you would have missed it. You would have missed it. The crack of the bat scared it. Boom! And the bat bent in his hands. But he, did, he was mad at the manager, Ed, his ex-teammate Eddie Lopat, who was managing Kansas City, was razzing him the whole game. You're over the hill, Mick. You can't hit no more. You're over the hill. Kept razzing him. And he kept getting madder that, that the vein was popping out of his neck. According to people who was right there, the vein, the vein. Mickey's getting be mad, boy. He's looking at Lopat. And he's kept razzing him. You're done. You're over the hill. And boom. And he ran to third base and Lopat wouldn't even look at him. Put his head down. Walked in the locker room. But I, I talked to a lot of people, guys. Teammates. Opponents. Fans. They said minimum seven. I mean, they're, and I know it sounds impossible. He hit balls. Well, here's another one, guys. He, it's in the Guinness Book of Records. In 1960, after Paul Ford, that game in Detroit, he hit one 643 feet. That was measured. That will give you some idea. 643 was measured, trig measured trigonometry. What do you that, that word is? Yeah. After the fact, landed a number yard across the street on the fly. 643. Threw a crosswind. It's in the book. Explosion. So this is palatable. That could have went 700. You're right. He hit it like it was like a rocket. I mean, this. So then it was at the restaurant. You got to ask me something about the fisher, yeah. Right. So and he said, "Well, it was pretty good. It was the hardest ball I ever." Sitting with the people from the press. Yeah, we were all sitting together. Where, where else have you uh, you been, oh. been present as, as oh. a press member of the press? Oh my God! Another man of press conference at the Woodlands in '82. I went to the dinner. Then I went to the press conference. That was another one. I went to a press conference for Hank Aaron. Willie Mays bought me breakfast at Atlantic City in 81 at Bally's. Me and Dave Yonke. I was, Were you a writer? I wasn't a writer, but Dave got me in. How did I just you get got, in? How did you get connected? Dave got the connection because he rewrote for the dispatch. He took me with yours, him. A friend of yours. Yeah, Dave, Dave Yonke. I used to be a sports writer. Mm -hmm. So I was supposed to be a sports writer. I, I, Mays bought you me. You press credentials? Yeah, bought us breakfast. We spent an hour at Willie Mays. In 1984, I played softball at Whitey Ford to Poconos. He owned, he owned a place at Penn States. Whitey Ford, I went one for two against him. It was only slow. C.D. Wonder could have hit him. It was slow pitch. But it says Whitey Ford. I was nervous batting against him. I was like this. Maybe 500 off Whitey Yeah, it was slow pitch. But I swung at the first pitch both times. I was so nervous. I couldn't wait. And that was, but Mays was unbelievable. Cutting his, watching Willie Mays eat his eggs. This is Willie Mays. Yankee Stadium, you've been on the, uh, uh, the press at the stadium? Yes, I was, uh, Dave got me on there twice. Once in 1980 for a playoff game, but it rained against Kansas City game three. And, 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 and batting practice was canceled. So that was, I sat in the dugout. But in 81, I did Old Timers Day with Dave. I was on the field. I talked to Roy Campanella on a cassette, P.B. Reese, Monty Irvin, Catfish Hunter, a bunch of Hall of Fame, Lee McPhail, uh, whatever. We're on the batting cage. And they wheeled Roy Campanella on his wheelchair. I'm talking to Roy Campanella. In 1981, this is. It's unreal. And I'm watching batting practice. Pee Wee's taking BP. I said, Pee Wee, should be in the Hall of Fame. He said, I'll never get in. He got in. He got in. But he said, I'll never make it. Pete, what a nice man. That was 81. Did you see Mickey that same day? Well, this is an unbelievable story. I couldn't get in the locker room. Only the dugout and the field. I had no locker room pass. True story. I'm walking by the locker room. And some guy's filming. I don't know who he was. A guy with a camera. And I look in the door. And Mickey, Yogi, and White are in a circle talking, 20 feet from me. And Mickey goes, come on, Mercer, come on, Mercer, we're going to be late. Come on, Mercer. So Whitey comes out, and then Mickey comes out, and I'm about 10 feet away. I said, Mick, welcome home. He stopped in his tracks, turned around me, and smiled. Everybody wanted an autograph. I said, Mick, welcome home. Well, and he, it, he, it got to him. He turned around and gave me a little smile. This is before my car show, way before. And he went out, he went down the railing. Yeah, true story. I was some guy filmed me. I don't know who he was. Just filmed me, out with the camera out there. I think he's and he somebody found it. You found it, or Dave Yonke? I found I, it. I found it. I Johnny knew found it. I never knew it existed. And I had to call him up and say, "Is that you?" And, and then he's got me on the field talking to Monty Urban in the dugout. In the dugout, Tommy John ignored me. That's okay. But I'm, I'm talking to Monty Urban, a Hall of Famer. In Campanella, you hear my voice in Campanella talking to Roy. That was '81. That's a, that's. A,
the stories are endless. I, it's, it's like a Rolodex. I could talk all day about this. I, I'm not going to bore What amazes me the most, Frankie, about you is your memory on Mano, on how many home runs and who he hit them off and well, what the pitch count was. Not all, Johnny. Not all. Well, but I know what you're saying. You, I, you know quite a bit uh, yeah. about you. Well, I know more than the average fan does, probably. But the Fisher shot I talked about, it was. I wish I could have seen one thing that would have been it. It was a rocket. The, the, little, the, the home plate umpire, Lou DeMuro, before he died, he said, I never saw a man that strong that swings a bat like that. It was like a rocket. Boom! He said, the sound of the bat actually scared me. Boom! Just, it's gone. It's up, it's up to the lights in two seconds. It's how hard he hit it. And the one in Detroit kind of makes it plausible. 643 through a crosswind. The wind was in his face. I'll give you another one with Mickey. Uh, a USC in 51, his rookie year, exhibition game. He had one 656, which is documented. They cleared a practice football field, Jim. The width of a football field over the four something sign in dead center. They measured it at 656. 19 year old kid. That's plausible, isn't it? Then again, in the same game, bat lefty, opposite field. Over 500 opposite field on top of a story, a house across the street, over the left field, opposite field. This is all documented. It's not like making stuff up. So you can see 734 is not probably impossible. He said the bat bent in his hands. He felt the bat bend. So, talk about Mickey and obviously your, your love and passion for him. What, what's your most cherished item that you have of Mickey, from Mickey, about Mickey? That's a good question. Jeez, it's, uh, you know, I, I do have a lot of autographs. Uh, I have a, I don't have it anymore. I, I had a coach's bat that he used. It was autographed. Coaching bat. Co coach's bat that he used in spring training. But probably the, the, the thing I treasure most is the memories from my show. They're priceless. Not just one autograph. I met him 20 foot. Just sitting with them and talking, joking with them. Any, uh details about those two days? I mean, that's a lot of time to spend with your idol. Two yeah, two days. days. I bored him to death, probably. Any, any, any? Well, yeah, there's one great detail, guys. It was a week for his 53rd birthday. I got him a birthday cake and surprised him in his hotel room with a number seven pinstripe. Happy birthday, Mickey. Yeah. We took, and he was shocked. Nick, I don't know your birthday better than mine. <laughs> and he brought the cake back to the show, carried it in the butt, carried it in. And I got pictures of him holding the cake with them. I remembered his birthday, 53. It would have been 53 another week. They appreciated that. Yeah. yeah. Uh, he, 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 he how said is he, he, how is he to be with like that? This is your idol. This is a guy you grew yeah. up worshiping and, and a father figure to yeah. you. And now you get to sit with him for two it days. Was, Jim, it was, was, um, like? It was like I, I told my buddy after the show, you should have pinched me. Because it was like one big dream. I'm sitting with the greatest hero in America for 20 years. Everybody wanted to be this guy, including dead people. I mean, it was sitting with him and the reaction of people... Men would come up with tears in their eyes, grown men, tears, like they're meeting the second coming. Women come up, they, keep, they won't believe what they're meeting. He had that effect on people. He was that big. Yeah. I mean, it was, I can't explain it, Jimmy. To sit with him for two days, I've met him many times, but to sit with him. And he told Tommy, he said, he said that little guy makes me laugh, meaning me. He said, he makes me laugh. He liked me. I said, he, li he likes you. I gave him a cake. He said, that, he said, that little guy makes me laugh. He's funny. Do you have anything left from that? Those few days at the show? Any oh, I have a lot of autographs. Have left a lot of autographs. Uh, I have the best thing I have, uh -huh. which is, I guess, for me, is sentimental. Uh, when he, the last day he did the show on Sunday, I got him a diet coke. He said, "Mick, you thirsty?" He said, yeah, "Give me a diet coke, Frank." I kept the cup that he used after he left. I put the date on it. I have the sharpie he used in with the cup. And at his restaurant, when I had the press party for when Costas come in, I got the first cork that was for the bottle of wine that was open. The, umpire, the, the, the waiter gave me the cork. I have that too. The first thing bottle it open was that I got the cork. That's nuts. I got the cup he drank. I got his DNA in the cup, probably. I got the sharpie. I got the press kit he signed for me. Look at press kits, Jim. Nice press kits. Tons of stuff. He's matter of fact, he he didn't have a sharpie on him. But when he said I, don't, I want to get the press kit signed, he said, he said I don't have a pen on me. He said here, keep it. You're going to need a Mickey. So he he kept mine. Yeah, that's. And what is that? The press. Press they, 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 yeah, they, they handed out like press kits for everybody that went there. I wasn't a press right? They didn't know that. Uh -huh. Information on his career, his childhood, his career. Bunch of stuff, pages. Okay. And he signed the front for me. And he didn't have a Sharpie. I said, Mick, keep it. Can I buy you a drink? He said, no, Frank, I'm not drinking today, thanks. Okay. Dude, but I got the cup. 
The Sharpie and the cork. And you were on cloud nine, Frank. I well, guess. it was just something that I wanted. Yep. You know, it's not everybody gets that guy for two days to sit with him. It was like sitting with royalty. He was royalty. <laughs> you know, it's, it's amazing. If you grew up with a guy, you know what I'm talking about. If you, if you lived a little bit of it. Young kids, I just read about him. I could go back a minute here to an earlier discussion about when you went to uh, Mickey's uh, home. We first went to uh, Dallas to see his gravesite, Sparkling Hill Press Mausoleum. Uh -huh. Then we drove to Dell City, Oklahoma to see Barbara, the sister. Okay. And we stopped. There was a Mickey Mantle Steakhouse right by the minor league AAA ballpark with a big statue of Mickey out front, big brown statue. We stopped there, had dinner, took pictures of the statue, went to see Barbara, took her to lunch. And Tommy says to me, Frank, don't be saying you're having lunch with Barbara Mantle in the restaurants. She don't, she, you're going to embarrass her. You're having lunch with Mickey Mantle's sister. I won't, Tommy. I didn't say who she was, but I'm sitting next to Mickey Mantle's sister having lunch. Nice lady. Looks just like him. I mean, a lot like him. You can see the resemblance. Uh, Barbara Mantle. Tommy North. How many days were you down there with them? Four or five days. Four From five Dallas days. to Dell City to, uh, we went to Baxter Springs, where he had two balls in the Spring River when he, when, when, when he was discovered by a scout. He was only 16. He had two balls in the river. One right, one left hand at Spring River, about 450, at 15. And he, this guy, Tom Greenway, saw him, but he couldn't sign him. He's in high school. He said, I'll be back, kid. And he came back. But I went to the Spring River. I, I'm right by the, by the bank there where the water is. I, Tommy said, I'm going to push you in. I'm, I'm on the bank where the balls went. One righty, one lefty in the same game. He's a 15 year old kid. How do you know where the. How do you know where the well, we didn't really know the exact spot. Where yeah, we did really. It happened. Like, yeah, it was a field. We didn't even know that he hit a bomb. Oh, the field right. was dedicated. It was, not, it was a soccer field. Uh -huh. They made a soccer, but it was the same place where he played as a kid. The Baxter Springs Woods kids. Okay. They had it there. Mickey Mantle played here. Uh -huh. Baxter, there's the, but the field was a soccer field now. Frankie. And the so balls went in the river. So, yeah, so Tommy said the balls in the river, you're standing at the bank of the river. I'm standing at the, at the base of it. He said, I'm going to push in. I said, I don't care, you know, just kid around. <laughs> but for a kid that hit a ball like that, 50 years, the, the scout's eyeballs popped out. Yeah. Greenway says his eyeballs popped out. This Greenwell, did you ever meet him? Tom Greenwell, no, he died, but I got his autograph. You got his autograph. I paid I for it, it's all authenticated. It cost me 75 bucks on a government postcard. But I have, I have his autograph. Did you walk in the river like Mickey walked no. on the water? No. no. <laughs> <laughs> he had to be frozen to walk on that water. But, uh, but it was just, Tommy said, I know where everything is. He's been, you want to go to John? Yeah, we'll go. Baxter Springs, this place. Mickey Mantle played here. He played here. Did you go to his, his, his childhood home? Yes, I, in, in Commerce, oh, I, got a, so I got a piece of wood for the barn like this. The barn's falling apart. It's 100 years old. What, what's special about the barn? And, and well, his barn. dad pitched batting practice to him. The barn was a backstop. He pitched him when he was from seven years, six, seven on up, with his grandfather. The barn was a backstop. And I, the people come and tear it apart. It's falling down. I got a piece of wood like this. I got a piece of uh, uh, siding from the house. It wasn't original, but it came from the house. A paint chip, a rock from the front yard, a stone. Then we went to the football field where he got kicked in the shin. He got out some myelitis and as, as a kid playing high school football. So we went to the practice field, the real field. I got a rock from there. Tommy said, Frank, your head's going to be full of rocks when you're done. I said, well, I don't care. I'm taking this stuff home. And I, I save everything. You were proud of it, right, Frank? But, uh, at least a piece of a paint chip from the house. It wasn't original, but he lived in that house. And the barn is falling apart. You can see it in my living, in my bedroom. It's 125 years old, that barn. It was made during the Civil War, I think. Years ago. I mean, it's old. And there's still people come and take stuff, they told me. They take everything. I'm surprised it hasn't fallen down yet. I got a piece of wood like this. Tommy said, Frank, don't knock the barn down. I said, I won't, Tommy. I said, if I, he said, don't go in there, Frank. Don't look safe. I said, if it falls on me, leave me here. I can live with it. If I die here, leave me here, I said to him. He'll, he'll verify that. Leave me here, Tom. So you're nuts. But Frankie, they say that you know so much about Mano. Did you ever hear of a book on Mano that you'd never read? To my knowledge, uh, no. There might be some I don't know that's out there. I got about 50 cents while he was alive. It's been about 30-some since he's dead. And I got all of those. Plus a Jane Levy book, which I'm lucky to be in. Tell us, tell us about the Jane Levy book. Well, and where you met her and how you got involved with her. Well, I met her at the Mantle Family Office. She used to work for the Washington Post. And she was doing a book on Mick, The Last Boy. I'm very flattered. She wanted to interview me. Frank, I heard you, you know, you like Mickey, I want to talk to you. We talked for 20 minutes, Jane Levy. 
And she mentioned me in the book about three or four times. I was flattered. She sent me a copy of the book, guys. And she really flattered the hell out of me because I don't think it's true. She said, I talked to over 500 people. You're the best interview I've ever had with anybody with Mantle. Family, teammates. He said, in the book, I can show you. The best interview. Many thanks, Jane. And she was on Larry King talking about the book. I taped it. Larry King live years ago. Taped it. And she liked me. Mike not wouldn't talk to her. He wouldn't talk to her. He's a little too shy. Okay, I talked to her. He's from the Bronx. Grew up in the shadows of Yankee Stadium, Jim. Yeah? And uh, I mentioned the funniest story of the book. I'm not going to bore you in the book. Uh, I think I was in third grade, and my teacher said, uh, Francis, that was my real name, who's the father of our country, Francis? I said, Mickey Mantle, Miss uh, Jackson. He says, why? I said, he's more famous than Washington. His cards are worth more. I had to stay after school, but it was worth it. That's in the book. And I stayed home to tape his funeral on CNN. It was on CNN. I taped the funeral. I taped the whole funeral. I was crying. August, yeah, of 95. I have, picture, I have papers of his death, Lisa, from 14 different states. Of his death. It was like the president died. Mantle dead. It was like, this. Really, you guys were younger. He didn't remember. It was, it, when he died, it was like, wow. I mean, his funeral wasn't only on ESPN. It was on CNN. What does that tell you about this guy? His standing in this... Uh, it's on CNN. And I'm sitting there crying. Took it to, I said, I told my boss, you could fire me. I'm not coming in today. You could fire me. Why? Man, I said, yeah. I'll see you Tuesday. I, I went, he could have fired me. I wasn't missing his funeral. Fire. I would get another job. Fire me. He wouldn't fire me. I had six days coming anyway. But that wouldn't stop me. I still would have won. But that's true about the funeral. And Jane Levy. And you live, Mickey. Well, it, a lot of things, John. I, I'm a very different case than most people. It's, it's a different type of how it evolved. It really is. You know, that probably never should have happened like that. There's not many days go by that you don't even think about them, right? It was all over the house. Yep. No, I mean, it gave me so many thrills growing up. They're priceless. I told them the priceless memories are priceless. So you connect to not just Mickey himself, but the people that were around him. Yeah, and teammates. Like, uh, I heard that you, you reached out to... Uh, pitchers that have pitched against Yes, him, yes. And have I contacted and, them. Have contacted and On the phone, on the phone, Jim. In length with some of these, yes. uh, yeah, these I former can, ball players. Well, there's two in particular. Tom Lovrick, who gave up the home run at USC. He was a minor league pitcher of uh, March of 50, March 26th, at the football field home run, 656. I called him up. I got his number. I called long distance. He picked up the phone. He wasn't a big celebrity. He, he, he was flattered that I remembered him. I said, are you the guy who gave up Mantle's monster home run? He said, yeah. Who are you? I said, I'm his biggest fan. Something like that. And we talked for like a half hour. How far the ball was measured after the game. 6.56. It's in the Mantle book uh, explosion. 6.56. A 19-year-old kid. And then left-handed to the opposite field over 500. On top of a roof across the street. I mean, that's power. And who else does it mean? It's all how do you make those connections? Like, how do you get this guy's phone number to I, I just, call him? I knew he was in California. I knew the city he was in. Uh -huh. I dialed a long distance of the city. Tom Loverick. I spelled so it out. one day he woke up and said, I'm going to try to call Tom Loverick. Loverick today. He was like 80 then, Jim. He said he passed away. He was about 80. And he, 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 he sent me press clippings, copies of the day after the home run. He sent me stuff. Right. And he, he signed an autograph for me on Mantle's plaque card. I made Mickey Mantle famous, Tom Loverick, because of the home run. You I still, have it. You still have it? Yeah. Frank throw it out. Who else did you meet that gave Homer to him? Well, a lot of people. Not a lot. The, the, the other guy was a left-handed with the White Sox. Uh, he, he since passed away. Uh, Jack Harshman. Big lefty, Jim. Uh, Mickey hit for the cycle against Harshman. That was a, a milestone to me. I wanted to hit for the cycle. Single, double, triple, homer. So I got a hold of Harshman because I knew what state he lived in. Long distance information, Jack Archman, please. He's not his famous person. His number's in the book. So I called him. Who was this? Frank Martin. Who the hell are you? No. I said, I explained what I wanted to do. He said, okay, young man, we'll talk for a while. And he talked about the home run. The home, uh, he says pass, so big left-hander. But you know what he told me, Jim? He said his power was out of this world. But he said what amazed me more was his running speed. He looked like a racehorse going to first base. I used to watch him run when he hit a ground ball. He said, I, I he, he, he said, I very seldom struck him out batting right-handed. Here's another thing, Jim. Batting right-handed, he hit about 335 lifetime batting righty, 270 batting left because of the knee. It buckled on him. Batting righty, you couldn't get him out. He had 424 when you were batting right-handed. Just right-handed. That was 424. 
incredible right-handed hitter, natural. But he said, I used to watch him run like Secretariat. He got unbelievable speed. Everybody talked about his power, but I love to watch him run. And he told me, and I said, gee, Jack, Mr. Harshman. He said, call me Jack. And he died a few years later. Mr. Lugbert, I think, died. But they were like in their 80s then. This is 15, 10, 15 years ago. Frankie, I yeah. thought I heard a story one time about you and me, Randy Gumper. I went to Randy's house the first home run, me and Yonkai. We found now, him. Now, did Mano did know him as a player? Or? Well, yeah, no, this is true. Randy lived in Douglasville, Pennsylvania, uh, in the boonies, Pennsylvania. Farmland. It took us a day to find him, me and Yonkai. Yonkai's getting, where is this place? Come on, I'm getting tired of I was driving. Randy Gumper gave up his first home run May 1st. The ball I'm holding in my bedroom. First home run, Randy gave it up. Number one. It went for thousands of dollars. I found him in the phone book. I called him. I don't care. He could say, go to Gabber. I wouldn't bother him no more. I talked to Randy. Went to his house. We spent three hours with him, Jim, me and Yankai, just telling stories. He said about ten things for me. Right here, he's on a ball here. I'm just He says pass. And you just showed up and knocked on his... No, I already called him and said, I want to interview you. He knew he, he was coming. Yeah, he knew. I wouldn't just show up on him. When he grew up, he was sitting on the porch in a rocking chair. He was 6'3", big man. And uh, he was pitched for the Yankees. He pitched for the Yankees uh, before Mickey got there. He, he let me try his 1947 World Series Yankee Road jersey that he used, that he had the year they won the series. I tried on a pitcher, a real Yankee World Series jersey, and the hat. New York across the chest. He let me try it on. They wouldn't put it on. I said, I'll put it on. Randy, Mr. Gumper. And we spent two hours talking, telling stories. He gave up a grand slam to Lou Gehrig, Randy did, in 36. And he told me, he says, Frank, I said, Randy, how would you compare? He, he said, and I'm not making this up. He says, nobody could touch Mantle's God-given skills. He was the greatest combination of a power and speed of the game I ever saw. And he could have been so much better if he didn't get hurt and took care of himself. We know the story, the drink, and why he drank. And he said, he was just unbelievable. And I thought Ruth and Gehrig were great, but if you look at his God-given, what was in his body, switch hitter, power, he said he was incomparable. Randy, I mean, Randy saw a lot of guys. Pitch to Garrick, Grand Slam. You know, it's just, uh, this is all true stories. So you met quite a bit of them. Well, I, I met a few. Randy was nice, and Harshman, I talked to Harshman and, and Lone Walbrick. I didn't meet them, but I talked to them yeah. on the phone. I guess they were shocked they called them long distance. I didn't care how much the phone bill was. I want to talk to these guys. Anybody right. that was hooked to man or you were wanting to get hooked to the house? Well, I don't, if I could... I guess if I got the number, I would have called more people. But, I mean, it's just, how much could I go? Right. 500 home runs? But it was certain guys I wanted to talk to. Did you ever meet Jim Lomberg? I got a picture with him. And at a show in Philly. And he was the last home run? Number 536, September 20th, the Yankee Stadium, 68. Lomberg in Boston a week later when he popped up to Petra Sully. And he left the game in the first inning. That was the last at bat. And that jersey just went for over $2 million that he popped up with. It was in a heritage. Over two million. Yeah. I have it on tape, actually. You know, uh, but yeah, I, I asked Jim about Mickey. He said, "Yeah, he said the last time up I got him." And I talked to Rico Petrocelli, who caught the ball at shortstop. Rico, when he was up here for Old Timers Day, he said, "If I knew it was this last up, I'd have sucked the ball in my pocket. I'd be a millionaire." But I didn't think he was going to retire. He threw it back in the mound. They use it. It's gone. But he said I could have stuck it in my pocket. I didn't think he was going to leave the game. He was done. When I bat him, done. So, Frank, recently you reached out to somebody else. You reached out to Marshall Folvo, the legendary collector mm -hmm. um, who has some legendary memorabilia. Oh, the best. That you would uh, you'd love to, love to see. see someday. Yeah, and so how, did, how did that come about where you connected with Mr. Folvo? Well, thanks to my friend Gavin, in November he sent him some kind of text to his law firm office on the computer. Mick Mann, Frank Martin, please send him a note, Marshall, and make his day. And Gavin said he thought I'd never hear, I'd never hear from Marshall, and he sent me a little note that he sent to Gavin. I have it. Keep up, keep up the good work. Uh, happy collecting. I still have it. Marshall Fogel, November of twenty one. So I sent him a thank you letter because I had the return address. He sent me a, a magazine in the mail, a Heritage magazine. He's on the cover of. So I could see the address, phone number on the envelope. So I called him, and we talked for forty five minutes, and then it sends with Johnny and you. That's how, because of Gavin, God bless him, he got this whole thing going. Tell me about the letter you wrote. Yeah, that was about four, I got carried away around Christmas, about four pages, and I thought I might have, I might have upset him, because I got carried away. He went a little bit about me, and I started telling him about this stuff, and I said, I hope I didn't offend him, he thinks I'm a stalker or something. 
And he got back to me eventually, and uh, he sent me something else, some pictures of Mickey that you saw at the last Hall of Fame trip, those three photos. And I called him again, whatever, and this, we just got talking, and one thing led to another, and uh, it just happened. He knows I'm a big fan, I guess, and it just, it, it probably never should have happened. How many letters does he really answer? So how did Gavin started this whole process with Marshall Fogel? Why, why, why now? Why, why in that's a good question, Jimmy. When did he decide to do I, that? Well, that's a good question. I asked Gavin that, and he said, Frank, you've been talking about Marshall Fogel for, since I know you. Wanting to meet him. And he's, he's got the greatest piece of uh, cardboard on the face of the earth, Lisa. It's probably the most valuable piece of memorabilia known that exists. And I know it's worth a lot. I've heard whatever. I'm not going to even say but it's Marshall's 52 Mantle, Jim Mint 10 Plus. There's only two other ones, but they're not pluses. Tam Condi, Tam Condi, Adi, and uh, the guy who owns the Diamondbacks, Ken Kendrick, has the other one. And uh, that's the prize. Marshall's is the, is the creme de la creme. This card, Mr. Marshall, this is your card on the shirt. Your exact card's on the shirt. It is, your exact card without the holder. I got a cup of it. I got an 8x10 hanging in my bedroom of it. it. It fascinates me, that card, what it represents. He has the best one. And I know what he's ever going to do with it. I love to see what's it. So, what's so special about that card? Well, it's the first year the Topps made cards, Jim. And it was Mantle's second year, like Mays. They came up in 51. And they had Bowman cards. But Mickey's Bowman's not near what the Topps is. Tommy told me the perfect 10 Bowman. Only one's worth about $5 million. But this is multi, multi times the 10. There's three of them. Uh, it was his first Topps card. He was just becoming into his own. He was... A, became a national sensation. It was like it just came together. And that's, Tops is the first company the first year, and all their cards are big. I think the number one card, Andy Pavko, is worth a lot of money in top shape. Eddie Matthews, 407, is worth a lot of money. Hall of Famer. Last card in the set, 407. But the mantle is Mount Everest. Even compared to May's, not even close. Have it's you, Mount Everest. Have you seen 52 Tops mantle cards? Yes, I have. I saw Ken Kendricks on loan at Cooperstown about 15 years ago. I got a picture of it, the owner of the Diamondbacks. The one, the, the one of the three tens. The Marshalls is the best. A plus Marshall. The best. Could, could you handle the pressure of seeing this? Well, probably, no, I'd probably pass out. <laughs> but uh, I've seen Ken Kendricks, and I've seen him at shows, Jimmy. I've seen nines, eights, you know, shows. Yeah. You probably have too. Uh -huh. There's only three tens, but I did see one. Ken, uh, Ken Kendricks. Uh, but Marshall is the creme. If I could ever see Marshall's card, they could bury me right there on the spot. I mean, I don't know if I could handle it. You know, honestly, this whole collection is incredible. The whole collection is incredible. That's incredible. Everybody likes to see that. Sure. But the card is the, uh, that's the Mona Lisa. Well, that's, that's it. This is, uh, if I could get buried with, you know. Holy grail. Yeah. Sure it, says. it really is. Yeah. It's, uh.